remember, the Treaty of Versailles had three main conditions. And this is the Treaty of Versailles. So this is, you know, 1919. This is after World War I, but this is against Germany. The United States isn't a part of this, but Germany is supposed to be under this. And the rule is, number one, no military. You can't do this again. Number two, no joining Austria again. Austria and Germany are two separate countries. They can't join. Thirdly, no um, entering Rhineland. What is the Rhineland? The Rhineland. So here's France, here's Germany, here's Belgium. The Rhineland is this territory right before France. Don't go in there. Now the fourth one, which isn't part of the conditions, it's just the reality, is you have to pay for all the damage you did. Germany gets elected, or excuse me, Hitler gets elected in 33. And he's on the platform that he will bring respect back to Germany. What's the very first thing he does? Start building military. Slowly. He's not saying, well, I'm not being attacked. If you said we could have a police force, we're doing a really big police force. In fact, isn't that kind of our whole party? Is we're all kind of members of this? It's more of a police force, really, but we're beginning to build it. By the time we get to 35, he's not just building the police force, he's actually building weapons. And he begins to do it by doing this huge advanced air uh, craft, air force. It was a military that was supposed to be limited to police only. So, enough to have a police, yes, go ahead. Um, this may not have anything to do with it, but why, did, why weren't they allowed to go into Rhineland? Because it's right next to France. And that was where they had World War I. Remember, they went through Belgium because they were trying to attack France. And so France is like the treasure that Germany wants. So you can't go near them. Go ahead. Very much so, very much so. That's exactly what it is, very much so. So they, they start doing this. By 36 and 37, what else do they do? I think I gave you a whole list of things. There you go. For the first three years, immediate reaction. Now France, by this time, even though it's rule of law, is worried. So they develop something called the Maginot Line. And I'm only going to say this because it's a little funny. And it's, it's funny in a black humor sort of way. So here is France, and here is Germany, right? And okay, Switzerland and Belgium. So Belgium's got a bunch of mountains. And Belgium is on the same side as France. So they're allies. Germany is right here. Now remember, there's also big, giant Austria. As soon as Germany starts rearming, what can you do about it? Remember, Japan invaded Manchuria, and what does the League do about it? You shouldn't have done that. Okay, I guess we're not part of the League. Italy invades North Africa in 36, and what does the League do about it? Well, we're not going to trade with you. But really, there's nothing. So Germany starts to rearm immediately. You can't really force them. You can't go in there and police them. You can't throw them in jail. So Italy does, I'm assuming, uh, uh, France does a very reasonable thing. They create a wall. I mean, this is a huge, giant, enormous wall called the Maginot Line. It's, in fact, it's, it's amazing because they would have this a bunker system with underground tunnels, concrete, okay? And every so often, you'd have this great big bunker with uh, cannons faced out there. And supplies get to go from one bunker to the next. So bunker, 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 all the way up and down there. And the, and the tunnels are able to move supplies. This is an amazingly fortified position. Can anyone tell me what's wrong with this plan? Kind of, kind of. Scary. <laughs> yes, it's scary. <laughs> How about this? Um, 
They don't build it between France and Belgium. Why is that? Belgium's their allies. It's also mountainous. It'd be really difficult. But they're their allies. So we'll get to this. But when Germany eventually attacks, what do they do? They go through Belgium. And they do it amazingly fast. Three days. Nobody expected that they would do that. Because remember, in World War I, they got trapped in Belgium. But of course, in World War I, they didn't have the airplanes that they had. They didn't have the tanks. They didn't have the mechanized army. It's called Blitzkrieg, lightning army. Just psh, go super fast. They didn't have those things in World War I. World War II, they do. And so Germany gets behind the marginal line. Can you tell me what's wrong with this defense system? There's no way defense is behind it. <laughs> the cannons face one way, and it's in concrete. They don't go around. <laughs> no, we laugh a little bit. France was done in 30 days. Germany gone in three days. France gone in 30 days. Just that quick. It wasn't like France wasn't prepared. They put in millions into this Maginot Line. Dumb idea. Hitler rearms. By 36, we start moving. 36, he goes into the Rhineland, where he's not supposed to go. And what does Europe say? You're not supposed to do that. What does Germany say? I'm just defending my borders. Everybody has a right to defend their borders. I should be able to right to defend my borders. Okay, okay. And then he takes Austria, 38. They call it the big Anschluss. They all speak German. We speak German. We should have been united ages ago. We are one country. And it is illegal against humanity to prevent us from uniting like brothers should be united. What does Europe do? Nothing. And that was a major part of the Treaty of Versailles. And then, Sudetenland. Where is the Sudetenland? So we have this place, Czechoslovakia. And Sudetenland is this one section of Czechoslovakia. And some of them speak German. But Sudetenland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, all these people, they speak all sorts of languages. In fact, a lot of Austria speaks different languages. But Germany said, this area also should have been in Germany. Now the difference is that when Austria comes in, Austria kind of welcomed it. People would debate this. If you ever see The Sound of Music, there's a lot of people that say, I don't want to do this. But there's also a lot of people that kind of welcomed it. There's no big army that prevents Hitler from coming in. Hitler just joins in with Austria. Austria says yes. With Czechoslovakia, Sudetenland, the Sudetenland is one section of Czechoslovakia, the Czechs are saying, no, no, no. And Sudetenland, no, no, no. We don't want this. We don't want this. Hitler comes in and says, it's only fair. They all speak German. They should be part of the German master race. England and France and everybody gets out of alarms. Say, if you do this, this is maybe too far. Maybe you shouldn't do this. Hitler goes and talks with them, and they make an agreement. And they say, okay, you can have that but no more. And Hitler decides, he signs a paper, yep, no more. And what, two weeks later, he takes the rest of Czechoslovakia. Yeah, they all want to join. They don't want their brothers to be lost. What, is, what does Europe do about it? Nothing. Nothing. Because if you go back here, the rule of law and the rule by might what advantage does the rule by might have? You don't have to follow, follow any laws. You don't have to follow any laws. The rule of law means that if you make an agreement, you're going to follow it. Hitler loves the idea that we can make an agreement. Yep, we won't attack you if you promise not to take over Czechoslovakia. I'll sign that right away. Because what is he hearing? Nothing. We're not going to attack you, right? The if, totally irrelevant to him. You're not going to attack me now? Good. I'm signing it. You guys walk away. Two weeks later, I'll take over the rest. I'll sign another agreement, by the way, if you want me to. I'm being a little bit flippant here, but I, not that much. This used to be called appeasement. Appeasement is that we look at this, and to some extent, you have to understand this. The rule of law side, especially England, France, Belgium, they're feeling a little guilty. And Hitler's got that working for him. The Treaty of Versailles was unjust. You shouldn't have had these rules. So we're just in breaking them. 
Do what? What are they guilty about? Well, they feel guilty about imposing it. Remember, the United States didn't go along with it. The United States saw it was also too harsh. Well, 15 years later, the English and the French are thinking, well, maybe it was. Well, more of the English and the French. Maybe it was too harsh. Maybe we go ahead and let Hitler do this. After all, they have a right to be a country. That's appeasement. And Hitler is saying, yeah, go ahead and feel really, really guilty about it. What would have happened if they had a war in 1933, as soon as Hitler started rearming? How long would that war have lasted? Not very long. What happened if they had a war in 36 when he tries to take over Austria? It would have been longer, but would it have been as long? No, because it, it wouldn't have been as big. But you keep pushing. All Hitler needs is time. And he's willing to do anything in order to get the time. And so he takes over Czechoslovakia in 1939, and then he does the big one. Where's our map? Here's Germany. Here's Poland. Now I've got to give you another map. France, Belgium, Germany, Austria. Italy, Spain, Poland, Russia, Ottoman. Russia, Germany, Poland. Now remember, ideologically, where is Stalin in relation to Germany? Totally opposite sides of the fence. He's a communist, these guys are fascists. But as we also mentioned, on paper, it's on opposite sides, but in actual practice, what's the difference for the people living in those countries? Yeah, okay, a little bit of it. No, they're the same. They're both dictators. And so in 39, Hitler makes an agreement with Stalin. He has a bunch of parts to it. It's the Berlin Soviet Pact. Three parts are very public. Basically, it says, Hitler has no intentions of attacking the Soviet Union. If Hitler happens to go into Poland, it's not an attack on the Soviet Union. So Soviet Union will not respond in kind. It's a non-aggression. We're not fighting against you. Other parts, less public. The other agreement is, if we go in there, we're going to divide up Poland, and you get half, and we get the other half. So we'll divide it in half. And not only that, while we're doing this, you can go ahead and take out Finland, and we will not do anything about that. What does that seem like to you? It does seem like a treaty, doesn't it? Doesn't it kind of seem like an alliance? We already had an alliance, a very strong alliance between Germany and Italy, right? And these guys were allied across the waters with Japan. And so if he gets an alliance with Russia, isn't that pretty much all the rule by might, folks? And Stalin says, okay. And as soon as we get that pact, they invade. Very important. They invade in September 1st. They go in, they take out Poland. England and France immediately declare war. And then what do they do? Nothing. They start rebuilding, but what are they going to attack? Are they going to go over and defend Poland? No. They just know that Germany declared, and they told Germany they're, they're going to declare war. If they did this, they cross the line, they cross the line, they declare war, but then what do they do? Nothing. France has a Maginot line, he thinks he's protected. England starts, but they don't do anything. There are people in the United States that look at this and they call it a phony war. They look at this and say, well, the United States, or England is declaring war not because they really worry about Germany, but because they want the United States to jump right in and save them, just like we did in the first war. We're not going to do it. And so people were actually calling it a phony war. But what was Hitler doing? Yeah, Hitler is saying, I just need time. So he swept right through Poland, and then immediately, what is he doing? He's getting ready to go this way. He doesn't let it known, he doesn't make it obvious, but that's what he's planning on doing. Then England and France are just sitting there waiting. 
and the people in the United States said it's a phony war. England could take out Germany any time. Because remember, we beat them last time. Well, November 20th, Soviet Union starts going in there and nobody even pays attention. Take out Finland. We don't think of them because we're thinking about Germany. And yet, there's an alliance. The next year, we see action. They start going Norway, and then Belgium, and then France. By this time, England has got materials, but they're shocked. They're shocked by how fast the war happens zips through Belgium in three days. And part of it is called this fifth column. This fifth column starts because way back in 36, Spain was having its own little revolution. It wasn't part of the Allies. It wasn't done in any of these things. But they were having a revolution against the king. There was a capital city, Madrid. And they looked at Francisco Franco, and he had four columns going to this city. And everyone is watching this, the whole world, because he's got modern weapons. Four columns, he says. He's never going to be able to take Madrid. It's far too well defended. He comes right up to it. The world's watching. And the next day, he takes it. Just like that. And how does he do it? There was a fifth column inside the city that tore down all the defenses. And boom, he wins. This is shocked the world. Well, Hitler's not stupid. He did the exact same thing in Belgium. Belgium. He starts putting people into Belgium, in place. They look like Belgians. They look like the noble people. And Germany is getting all of its forces of the mass, and people say, no, they can't go through Belgium. Remember last time in World War I? That's where they got stuck. That's where the trench warfare was. That's what ended them. But Hitler just has a fifth column already in Belgium. And so as soon as he declares war, these guys come up. They take down all the defenses, and he sweeps through in three days. Everybody's shocked, especially France. They are lost in 30 days. France has to leave the country. Their government goes to England, and you have a government in exile, and all of France is now part of Germany. Now, irony of all irony, by 1940, the Americans, the people that don't want to get involved with war, they said, you know what, it's just not possible. Germany's way too powerful. Nobody could defeat them. Just let them go. Go ahead and give them Europe. Who cares? And that's what that, that America First cartoon was about. That's what Dr. Seuss is saying. Who cares? It doesn't matter. This is all about it. And we'll just say, we're a fortress America. We'll never be touched. Well, as soon as Germany looks at this, the world actually was almost agreement with this fear. Because Germany basically has everything. And they start attacking England and lobbing bombs, they do bomb raids, and England is very near worrying about being defeated because those raids are just plowing through London. In, in hindsight, England referred to this as England's finest hour because they are absolutely being bombarded. And they're that close to wondering if they have to give up. And pause for a second. What would happen if England fell? How would anybody be able to get back into Europe? Where do you stage the assault? From the water? It's a big deal. 